we need to uh, bring the mighty down to size by mocking them. Whereas I think the hilarity is actually the mighty are nowhere near as mighty as they feel obliged to appear to be. And that's which I, where, what I find uh, is, is right for humour and tragedy. Welcome to the Humorology podcast with me, Paul Barros, and my glittering lineup of guests from the worlds of business, politics, sport, and entertainment, who are going to share their wisdom and their use of humour with you. Humorology is the study of how humour can dramatically improve your business success and your life. Humorology puts the fun into business fundamentals, increases the value of your laughing stock, and puts a punchline back into your bottom line. Please remember to like, subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. My guest on this edition of the Humorology podcast is a powerful and punchy presenter, podcaster and political columnist. He's best known as the presenter of Radio 4's Week in Westminster, but he has established himself as one of the most pointed and prominent political journalists publishing in The Guardian, The Independent, The New Statesman and The Spectator, just to name a few. When he isn't presenting powerful radio or publishing political columns, you can find him performing and podcasting his compelling show, Rock and Roll Politics. His television career goes back decades as both a political correspondent and a presenter. His series of reflections from prime ministers to political turning points looks at the country's most important people and political moments. The only thing that matches his political expertise is his ability to present politics in a cool and captivating way. Steve Richards, welcome to the Humorology podcast. Thank you very much. Oh, it's a real pleasure to have you here. And I, I, I am a huge fan of rock and roll politics, which we will come back and talk about at length, I hope. But I wanted to go back to um, the young Steve Richards. Um, the Jesuits say, give me a child of seven and I will give you the man. Was the seven-year-old Steve Richards humorous or already interested in politics? I wasn't interested in politics at seven, but I've always, but certainly by seven, I was interested in performance. I loved performing. And uh, I kind of regretted, really. Um, there were certain key turning points where maybe I could have gone into performance as a full-time vocation, although journalism is really, as is politics. Um, but but I but I didn't. I went into journalism. But yeah, as a kid, I was fascinated by performance. And I was drawn to politics very early because of its performing dimension, the theatre of it. And shall I tell you where I learned about the importance of humour uh, yes. in this context? I, I think I was 11. And uh, it was 1974. And in that year, there were two general elections. In February 74, there was an election. And Harold Wilson, the then Labour leader, just won it, but only just. So he held another one in October 74. Now, as a kid, I was really, I was just watching from a distance. It was fascinated by Wilson because, you know, I heard my parents say, oh, Wilson's old and knackered and mad and stuff. And I thought, well, how can he be prime minister if he's old and knackered and mad? Anyway, uh, I noticed uh, he was on in um, uh, near where we lived and you could just turn up in those days. And I seem to remember some other, I think it was in the first year of secondary school, some other friends were off to see David Bowie at the Rainbow. And they said, oh, do you want to come and see Bowie? I said, no, I'm off to see Harold Wilson in North London. <laughs> um, but I'm really pleased I did because Wilson arrived at this forum. And this is a classic lesson about humour. Um, he, he arrived at this town hall, I think it was Camden Town Hall or something. And, you know, as I was very, very young, and he did look old and knackered. When I look back, he was relatively young still, but he looked, he looked 75, maybe 80, he was in, still in his 50s. And sure enough, the first bit of the speech was really boring. Yeah, three day me, a social... Blah, 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 blah. But then something really dramatic happened. And this is how you use humour in politics and in business and everything else. Um, it was the era when it was still anyone could turn up. And Wilson was talking quite boringly. And someone threw a negative, as quite often happened in those days. And it went all over this kind of already crumpled suit. 
And Wilson looked up. I'm, I've never, ever forgotten it and have learned so much from it. And Wilson looked up and said this. You know, I'll tell you something very, very interesting. Uh, in the 1970 election, after six years of a Labour government, somebody threw an egg at me, like the man being escorted from the town hall has just done. In February, six months ago, in the election then, uh, uh, after three and a half years of Conservative government, nobody threw an egg at me. I think, in February, I think it was an egg-free election campaign, and now somebody has thrown <laughs> an egg at me again. And then he paused, dusted the yoke down and said, which goes to show you can only afford to throw eggs under a Labour government. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the whole hall cheered and the mood changed. Wilson looked 30 years younger. He danced around the stage. The crowd were cheering him on. And um, it, it's a moment that has stayed with me. When I speak to politicians, it was very interesting. I spoke to one of Wilson's uh, kind of allies many, many decades later. And I told him this thing. It's the only time I saw him lie. Um, he said, oh, yeah, Wilson. He learned to have a sense of humour. He didn't really have one. But by the end, he was like a stand-up comic. He was hilarious. He could tell a good kind of joke, and he learned it. Whether he learned it or could do it, um, I think if you want to ask why he won, he used to go around saying, you know, I won four elections out of five. A record, I think you'll find. Um, <laughs> now, I think humour really helped him. And it's it, a lot of politicians underestimate the power of humour as a kind of political weapon. And so do business leaders. And so do, you know, some in the media who do kind of talks and speeches with tedious slides and stuff. If you can use humour, you've got an audience with you. And I learned that. I'm quite pleased I didn't go to David Bowen. Uh, you know, I learned then a lot about the power of humour, certainly in politics, but elsewhere too. That is fascinating because we had Matt Ford on the podcast, who I, um, yeah. you know, who's a, a comedian and a, a political interviewer as well. And we were talking about, because we both grew up in uh, the comedy store, the, the I, power I, of it accepting the heckle and you become, in inverted commas, godlike. Exactly. If you... If you 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 have a superpower at that point, if you can turn that adversity around. But I'm interested to follow up on. You said that Wilson learnt humour. Do you think it's something that can be learnt, or the comedy instincts have to be there first? Well, I was fascinated when someone told me that about Wilson, uh, because he did learn it. But I think on the whole, you can't. Um, it can be a bit embarrassing. And I can think of politicians who've tried humour when they haven't really got it. And it's on the whole embarrassing. Now, I argue generally that you have to use it if you want to be an election winner. But as we all know, Thatcher was an election winner and had no sense of humour. And when she tried to deliver lines, you know, um, which had been written for her, it was just embarrassing because she clearly didn't get the joke. And if you don't get the joke, there's no chance the audience are going to get the joke. So I think on the whole, you have to have it. But if you haven't got it, you better try and learn it if you want to get into any public arena. Because it's interesting you use that word power. It, it is empowering. It turns everything on its head. So for a second, to go back to heckling, it looks as if the heckler has the power but you turn it round and suddenly you are godlike in dealing with the situation. You know, it, to, to take the current uh, situation, you know, Keir Starmer, I think, needs to learn to use humour a lot more. Um, he can be quite funny privately, you know, he's very, when he's relaxed, but he needs to find a way of deploying it uh, to expose and ridicule Johnson and others. And when you do, it not only has people with you because they are laughing with you and not at you, um, it makes opponents uncomfortable as well. So, but it is an interesting point about whether you can actually acquire it. I think most people have it instinctively if they've got it. Well, I, I in uh, your brilliant book, The Prime Ministers We Never Had, uh, you actually talk about imposter syndrome stalking the corridors of power and crippling people's campaigns. And you said it's best to acquire your charisma after winning with modesty, as Thatcher and Blair did. Um, 
because yeah. and I think you talk about the ebullience of, of people like Ken Clark that, that actually got in the way of people connecting to him. And, and I wonder because you we now live in the era of Boris Johnson. Um, have has that shifted now whereby people see it as an advantage again? Um, I'll come to Johnson in a minute, but the, the example I use most in the Prime Ministers we never had was Michael Portillo. Now, he didn't actually have humour, but he did have charisma. And there was a feverish excitement about Portillo in the mid-1990s, when a lot of people thought he was about to be Prime Minister. Thatcher wanted him to be Prime Minister. All her followers wanted him to be. And he had an aura. And I remember thinking then, this is going to finish him off. It, it, there's too much excitement around him. It's much better to have the excitement once you've won, because people don't trust you, people are jealous, you know, your colleagues and so on. And with Portillo, he, he went through so many metamorphoses as a public figure. Um, it always felt uncomfortable. Um, now, Johnson is interesting because he makes people laugh. Um, and I've got absolutely no doubt when people say, well, why do people forgive him so much? It's because he makes people laugh. That is empowering uh, for him. And you're right. Yeah, it, it, he, it helped him rise to the top. But it wasn't the key thing. Brexit propelled him to the top and the fear that the Brexit party was going to destroy the Tory party. And there was, oh, we're out. Come on, mate. We're out. October the famous. Not true, by the way, like most things he says. <laughs> um, but um, uh, I, I watched... Uh, when he was really popular, you know, they won that Hartlepool by-election last year, gained it from Labour, very unusual. I watched people watching him and they were smiling, you know, and that was his power. I think it's gone quite a lot with all the stuff that has emerged. Um, but, yeah, that has he helped him massively rise to the top because when you think about it, what were the other qualifications? You know, peripheral foreign secretary, you know, with all kinds of gaffes associated with that period and so on. But he makes people laugh and that is empowering. Yes, and, uh, but do you think that Labour, because you mentioned Keir Starmer and we had Yasmin Alibi on the uh, Brown on the show, who is desperate for him to show his charisma, show his funny side. But do you, do you think that there's a danger with uh, Labour and the attitude towards Boris Johnson of, of like, oh, it's all jokes and no judgment, like um, uh, Labour did <laughs> all those years ago? Yeah. Of, you end up looking a bit po-faced and the public doesn't like that. You want to at least recognise Boris Johnson's humour because, uh, I mean, I'm not a fan, but he can be funny. Now, that's a really good example. You see, there was William Hague, uh, Tory leader in a very difficult period, 1997 onwards. But one thing that sustained him was he was funny. He, he you know, he, he could be hilarious in the House of Commons. It was quite a sort of rehearsed wit, but he actually, and it was a bit like Harold Wilson as a sort of Yorkshire kind of style of, uh, telling a joke and um, he was hilarious but it was dealt with brilliantly by Blair and Alistair Campbell and others they thought how the hell are we going to deal with this he's he's winning over the whole house of commons he's got the whole house of commons laughing and they did it cleverly by saying he might be good at the jokes but where's the policy now that is an obvious attack line for Johnson because even more than Hay, who was quite a substantial figure in terms of policy and politics uh, you could apply it to Johnson you do apply it. exactly. That's the problem. You don't want to appear some po-faced, humorless, hair-shirted kind of politician where let's all be miserable and not laugh. So that's why I think it's even more important for Keir Starmer to use wit, um, preferably his own, but if someone has got to write it, but still use it. Every Prime Minister's questions, there should be a joke in there, uh, ridiculing, exposing the absurdity of the Johnson regime. Um, and it, it, it is so powerful. And it is deeply disturbing for the victim of the joke if you have Tory MPs laughing. Now, that did happen at times when um, 
Blair was leader of the opposition. He used humour well um, against John Major. And he sometimes had Tory MPs laughing with him as he mocked John Major. Um, and Cameron did it when uh, Gordon Brown was very vulnerable. Do you remember when Gordon Brown didn't call the uh, early election? And Gordon yeah. Brown denied it was anything to do with the fact the opinion polls were turning. She shouldn't have done, because that was the reason why I didn't call it. And Cameron got up and said he must be the only prime minister not to call an early election because he's frightened of winning it. And it got the <laughs> Labour MPs were laughing as well as Tory MPs. And yeah, that, yeah. to use your a very perceptive word, so empowering and so diminishing of the person who's being mocked. If you are witty or off the cuff, there is the danger that you will say something that will be blown up in the press as, you know, uh, uh, when it's written down, oh. a joke can seem incendiary, can, can it not? So uh, is that why they're holding back, you think? I don't think they've quite realised that, that if we talk about Starmer and his team, the potency of wit. I suspect he too personally might be uncomfortable with it because, you know, as a director of public prosecution, there is a sort of loyally way of dealing with debate. You sort of forensically analyse in a rather mannered way in a court and you don't use humour because, you know... Um, and I think he's only slowly realising that politics and the House of Commons is a wholly different arena. Um, and so I think that might be a bit of it. And then, as I say, I don't think, you know, I've actually, uh, I, I, I use the argument so often that wit is a potent political weapon. I think, sure, I've mentioned him and others. Um, but I don't think they've quite clocked how important it is to make an argument, deflate the opposition, to humanise you. Because when you've got voters laughing with you, you have got them, you know. I mean, Wilson, to say, is a really good example because I, I, I've obviously, I, you know, I wasn't around to witness this, but uh, when Harold Macmillan was going through real problems as Prime Minister and Wilson was the leader of the opposition, for example, there was a famous occasion when Wilson, uh, when Macmillan sacked half his cabinet, the night of the long knives, it was called. Yes. And Wilson just popped up. And what about this for a perfect soundbite before that word was invented? I see the prime minister has sacked half his cabinet, the wrong half. And, <laughs> you know, you just kind of uh, get him completely. And, you know, whereas there have been chaotic reshuffles in recent times, I can't remember anything a leader of the opposition has said. And, and, and I only remember it because I saw it on YouTube or somewhere, that Wilson soundbite. But I've, I won't forget it because it's hilarious when you it kind of mocks the, oh, he's got the wrong bloody, it's chaotic anyway, and he got the wrong bloody half. Um, so all the rubbish ones are still in there. I mean, it's, it's, it's very clever. It takes 20 seconds, um, but it's funny. It's what we call in, in comedy a zinger. Yeah. You, but in order to do a zinger, you have to be able to actually deliver it. And I don't, uh, here's my belief is I don't think Keir Starmer does it with belief. Yeah. And gusto. You can't half heartedly go for it because the gag will fall flat on its ass. Yeah. Yeah. There's a musicality to humour and gags and uh, as there are to speeches, you know, um, they've got to be kind of symphonic. And if there's a discordant moment, it, it is totally counterproductive. So you're right. You've got to deliver it with belief this is going to be bloody hilarious um, and if you're unsure it's going to be embarrassing but you know the stakes are so high in that public arena um, if you haven't got it naturally to try and learn it in, in the way that say Wilson did I think Blair sort of learned it I mean he could be very funny privately as well he had both Blair and Brown had a sense of the ridiculous and uh, uh, Brown, while his public demeanour was so serious and Calvinistic, blah, blah, he could guffaw with laughter uh, when he was in a good mood privately. Uh, fairly rare, but uh, when he, was <laughs> good mood, he, 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 he had a sense of the absurdity of it all. I, and that's the thing is... I think they need to work on the fact, because I understand, and you've met him and other people I know who've met him, that he is witty and charming in, in private Keir Starmer. It, and it's like, it probably takes somebody like me who 
trains people to do this, to come in and go, if you're going to do it, do it completely. Rather than, you can't sit on the fence with humour. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, and yeah, no, I've done uh, some media training and, and you can, I think, to go back to your original point, is it instinctive? I think you can train people to project more effectively. Um, and But it's no good. You see, I've heard people in his office say, oh, when people meet Keir, they really like him. Now, that's been said about a lot of people who are afraid of then lost elections because you have to project more widely. Than you, you're not going to meet all the voters personally <laughs> and sit around having a coffee and a bit of a laugh with them. So you have to find a way. And, and one of the things they need to learn is the art of almost like instead of over rehearsing for some interview, say, you know, the, the, whatever the replacement is to Andrew Meyer, you know, you, you spend two weeks rehearsing every possible question. You go in basically terrified, and too stiff with rehearsed answers. You've got to be in a constant conversation with voters and see it as a constant conversation. Um, and very few of them do. Uh, they're so terrified by it all, frankly. Um, and yet yeah, that is the way to do it. Because once you regard TV or radio as a conversation, you know, you can then put in the jokes as you, or, or try and say something funny as you would in a conversation. But if it's, oh my God, what if they ask that? And that question about tech, tax and, oh, I better not say that. And suddenly you're, which was the Gordon Brown problem, terrified by everything. I remember once when um, John Humphreys asked Gordon Brown when he was Prime Minister, you know, the height of all the pressures. And, uh, are you enjoy? Do you enjoy being Prime Minister? And Brown, because he had a journalist mind, thought if he said yes, which is what you, you should have said, you know, I mean, it's a perfectly valid answer. All the headlines would be Brown enjoying himself as the country collapses, you know. So his answer was unbelievable. I wake up at 5.30, feel a deep sense of duty to the... No, but are you enjoying yourself? I wake up at 5.30, feel a deep sense of duty mm. and responsibility. You know, and it, it just sounded absurd. And you say, yeah, look, of course, but that's not the issue. You know, I, I wouldn't be doing this job if it wasn't satisfying and, and on as you put it, enjoyable, but it's because I have this deep sense of responsibility that I find it fulfilling. You know, there are ways around it, but if you're too nervous, um, forget about humour, you know, it just becomes ponderous. And then you turn voters off, of course, and all, and whatever world we're talking about, uh, a piss off public event, audiences of public events or whatever, because it's, it's, too stilted and, and, and formulaic, et cetera, that, then it's a disaster. Well, absolutely. And with my psychological hat on, I would say the first chapter in my first book, The Pitching Bible, was called It's All About Them. And you have just perfectly described of how it should be uh, if you're in a media interview. It is a conversation and you are listening to the other person. If yeah. you are in your head going, I must make a point about the fact that we reduced VAT in, in the last parliament or they, your head is so full of that stuff. You can't actually just flow. And, yeah. And yeah. You see, what happened in the uh, 80s and 90s is Peter Mandelson, rightly said to Labour politicians, they'll interview you for 20 minutes and take one clip. So just give the same answer every time, the clip you want. But the problem with that is with longer interviews, it looks ridiculous because it means you uh, appear demented that whatever <laughs> is being asked, you just say, uh, I pledge to cut the cost of living by 10%. And if you vote for us, you'll do it. And then they say, yeah, but what about um, uh, defence spending? I pledge to cut the cost of it. You, you, you know, you, you've got <laughs> yeah. to engage as a conversation. And I mean, politics is partly an art form. It's many other things, but it is artistry. You have to convince people you have a vision and the policies that accompany the vision and the values that shape the vision. And it, it is artistry, it is communication, it is language um, that does it. And, and as we've been discussing, humor is absolutely part of it. 
Well, I, I couldn't agree more. And it's lovely to hear from somebody who actually is in the heart of politics and has been for many years. But that whole sense of humour is a part of the whole wider thing of showing people that you have a level of emotional intelligence. I mean, humour surely is the quickest way to do that. And, and politicians who I don't like or agree with do that. I mean, Farage understood that. Yeah. You know, yeah. William yeah. Hague, as we discussed, who was on this show as well, you know, he proved it in, in person. And yeah. and definitely Boris Johnson understands that. I'm wondering why um, Labour wouldn't fight fire with fire and actually put somebody with a natural sense of humour up um, to be a, a leader, because they seem to to push people away who are... I'm saying the word perceived as frivolous. Well, let, let's explore that a bit because, you know, say there are many layers to politics and I don't think, you know, to put it crudely, vote for me, I'm funny, is, is, is going to fly. But it is an interesting point that when Labour have these never, you know, how many leadership contests have they had recently? Loads. Um, it tends to be people who emerge who are quite scared by the prospect of public performance, interestingly, because mm. in opposition, all you've got is public performance. You can't be judged by policy implementation, got no power to implement them. So if you look at recent leaders and indeed other candidates, I mean, Jeremy Corbyn emerged um, and he had never been at the centre of the political stage. You know, he had always been in the background. Now, actually, he is quite a convivial person to have a cup of uh, coffee with, but he could never quite work out what the hell you do at the centre of the state. Ed Miliband, the same. Um, he was never sure of his public persona, and therefore he tried to, although his, he, he was to the left of Blair, he tried to adopt Blair's sort of mannerisms, very revealing. So did his brother David, because they weren't sure who they were as public uh, figures. They were more academics, really, I think. Um, and so who have we, and we've talked about here, Starmer. Um, I think it's harder for Labour because uh, the media is more hostile to Labour. And that generates a much greater sense of defensiveness and caution. And, you know, even when Labour were winning those landslides, you know, they would spend hours saying, I don't know, what if I say this, what will happen? You know, and oh my God, you know. I remember uh, being in, uh, seeing Blair for a coffee just after the 97 election. And he was about 40 points ahead in the polls, you know, the Tories in complete uh, disarray. And we were just talking, he used to invite a journalist in every now and again. And we were having this coffee and then suddenly Alice Campbell and Angie Hunter rushed into the room where we were having this coffee and they said, William Hague has changed the Tories' policy on rural post offices. I said, Christ, what the hell are we going to do? Are we going to, do we agree with them? Do we, you know, should we put out a press release? You know, there's this constant, having lost four elections in a row, there was this constant fear that the Tories would leap ahead and win again. And I think that does, you know, someone like Johnson, who um, has the power of the telegraph and the, on the whole, the mail and all these papers backing him, it's easier to do this stuff and, and, and to outrageously link Ukraine with Brexit because he knows he's not going to be slaughtered in the same way that a Labour leader or prime minister would be. Um, so there's more space for Tories. But but remember, Theresa May emerged and had no humour as a public person. Now, I'm told privately she could be quite humorous, um, although it's quite hard to imagine. Um, <laughs> but there weren't many laughs, you know, when she spoke. Um, and I mean, Cameron sort of copied Blair and could do humour. And I think that helped him hugely, actually. Uh, going back to the, the Labour thing, would it be a complete disaster? I, I personally think Jess Phillips, for instance, just plucking a name for this guy, has a good sense of humour. Yeah. Is it too dangerous because A, um, she's a woman, B, she's quite funny and that will get a backlash uh, in, in the media, uh, rather... Would that would that be a, a disaster in your opinion? 
I don't think it would be a disaster. And, and I agree with you. She's the same when you see her privately as she is uh, yeah. in a public arena. So she gets it, this need. I mean, I hate it because it's so overused, but it, it, it it's overused for a reason. This thing about authenticity. Now, there is a sort of, uh, there's almost a sort of laugh in authenticity because you can learn to appear authentic. <laughs> because it is still partly an act you know it's it's uh, to go back to my 10 year old self it's performance um but she can perform while looking wholly natural and yeah. that would make her in many ways a good leader but with labor especially there are many other things you have to be a master of economic policy um you have to navigate this hell of tax and spend in any general election where Tories will claim there are all kinds of hidden tax bombshells about to erupt if you vote Labour. And it's very, very difficult. Um, and, and so you have to have many other qualities. Uh, actually, that's reminded me of quite a funny anecdote. Um, when Roy Hattersley, in 19, the 1987 election, was shadow chancellor, uh, and as ever, Labour were navigating the bombshells of tax and spend. And he was live on the main most watched bulletin of the week, the weekend Saturday night, 10 o'clock bulletin, Hattersley, Shadow Chancellor. And um, he had just left a rapturous rally because a lot of people thought Labour were doing, were fighting a very slick campaign in 87. And um, he went to do this um, interview as Shadow Chancellor. And the presenter, I think it was Martin Lewis, somebody said, uh, so Mr Hattersley, uh, you reject the idea that under Labour, the tax for middle income earners will go up by half a P in the pound. And that's, it. that's an absolutely preposterous idea. I can't think of anyone who's economically literate who propose that at the moment. And Martino said, that's what your leader, Neil Kinnock, said three hours ago. <laughs> and Hattersley has written since, I did the only thing available to a politician in such circumstances, I attacked the interviewer. And then he said he went back to his hotel room and he phoned his best friend in politics, John Smith. And he said to Smith um, on the phone, was it as bad as I think it was? And John Smith said to Hattersley, much, much worse. Um, oh. And that is that is the hell Labour get into often with tax and spend. So you need to go back to Jess Phillips' numbers. I, I don't know the answer. Maybe she's got it. You need to sort of have absolute mastery of how you not only develop economic policy, but project it. You have to have a credibility and seriousness. So because newspapers otherwise, like they did with Neil Kinnock, said you're not prime ministerial. Um, so there are many, many things. But I think you're on to something that they need to push much higher up the sort of list of criteria this capacity just to engage and explain. In a book I did on prime ministers, and not the prime ministers we never had. Yeah, no, the, the first one, the great one. The election winners, the big election winners, were all kind of political teachers, which means they could explain why they were arguing what they were doing. And it could be absolute bollocks, if we're allowed to say that uh, on of this. Uh, um, so Thatcher, you know, she was an instinctive teacher in the late 70s when she was developing this monetarist economic policy which could have been really unpopular because it involved deep spending cuts and all kinds of things but she used to go around and say my father in his shop in Grantham never ever spent more than he earned and a country cannot spend more than it earns now it's rubbish because a country can print money and do all kinds of things yeah. but it kind of makes sense you know, think oh yeah you know this labor government spending like it's going out of the fashion and it's reckless and here's someone who's going to put us on the straight and narrow like george osborne don't trust those who maxed out the credit card as if the whole global financial crash was down but it, they are using language as teachers and and they are the winners blair did it wilson did it you know that you gotta be communicators so i think you're right labor shouldn't at the very least they shouldn't shouldn't elect someone without that skill there are other things required but that's one of them yeah, I, I completely agree. And I'm really interested in the whole communication, obviously, because this is, you know, my passion and, and, and the psychology of it. But the whole thing about that, what the Conservative Party do really well is they come up with 
great little sound bites and 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 slogans and and, and it's so cynical that you and I can see it coming a mile off, but it works. Yeah. Yeah. And if Labour doesn't find a way of countering it, they will carry on losing most elections. I've been thinking, you know, today about that word freedom, um, which uh, Thatcher seized it and said, I'm, you know, my proposition, I'm going to free people from the state. Now, actually, the state can free people. But, you, you, you know, because the state, if you if you need an operation, the state will free you from the fear of being ill. For example, if you want if you want a good job, the state will free you from where you are by training you to get the good job. But she made the state the stifling enemy and freedom was what she was offering. And it, it's to this very day. Very interesting. This the crisis over the sacking of the P&O workers uh, recently was very interesting because most of the time uh, the government hails this lightly regulated labor market freedom frees up people to employ, to sack, but it means it's a thriving economy. Then these workers are sacked live on a video which goes on Twitter and everyone panics. Oh, maybe we want more regulation so people are free to feel secure, free. But you, so the way that language is used is very interesting. The word, the phrase tax burden has always interested me. Well, if tax is spent on the NHS, is it a burden? Because you can then get an operation. But you know, so so language and communication. I share your passion for it. Um, it is it is absolutely the heart of so many spheres, and certainly politics. And I I genuinely think that until Labour put their attention there, they are going to be in permanent opposition. Because I, it, I agree. And and it, by the way, I don't think it takes that much. I don't uh, think you know they could they could just ring you and me. And, and it would already go up 50 yeah. percent, uh, yeah. he says. Yeah, I, I, I think it is one of the easier things uh, a, a, a politician has to master, you know, in, in opposition. So it's it, it's how you do it. It's, it's, well, it's, it's linguistics. Possible. It's who owns you. Do, you started the, the thing. Who owns the word freedom? And yeah. if you suddenly go, the Tories own the word freedom. They'll win election after election. Absolutely. Doesn't need anything to say. No one's going to say in a vox pop in, you know, um, a marginal seat like Basildon. Now oh, I'll give this freedom, Lark, mate. I don't want to be free. <laughs> Everyone say, oh yeah, we want this. You know, I mean, it's so obvious. As you say, it's not difficult. It, but and it's one of the reasons why Labour loses so many elections. Well, it, it's uh, somebody said once said to me when I was doing a lecture. Um, uh, and they meant this in a good way, but it came across in a way they said, isn't a lot of what you're saying just common sense? And I said, unfortunately, it's uncommon sense. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And because this is what what uh, we can see this, but uh, but people don't know it until they're shown it. You're absolutely right. It should you know, these really intelligent people, much more intelligent than me, uh, don't see it. I'm a huge fan of your podcast, Rock and Roll Politics, which you also do live around the country, which uh, is just fantastic for all our listeners. Um, download Rock and Roll Politics now. Uh, and it kind of takes a weekly behind the scenes look at UK politics and the media and uh, how that shapes the way we view, you know, epic political dramas. Do you think that humour has in any way shaped the political landscape of the last few years? And I'm thinking, you know, all the things that have happened, Trump, Johnson, Zelensky, um, Reese mogg all those things. What's, how has that affected the political landscape? Well, certainly e events and characters um, uh, lend themselves to humour. I don't do satire you know this sort of old Prescott he's fat and stupid isn't that hilarious kind of thing I, uh, <laughs> but when you kind of step back and try and make sense as you say of Johnson Trump and so on it the, there is dark humor to be had from it now what I call my stuff is more sort of uh, a columnist on stage when I started doing the Edinburgh Festival the first year I was just in uh, comedy but it's it's more it's more a column on stage but it's amazing how much humor 
creeps into it because when you are exploring these characters and their flaws and the dramas that erupt around them of which they have to be pretend to be in control but they are not you have humor uh, because on one level uh, it is absurd and that is the fundamental absurdity by the way um, that um, you know it, in our media culture certainly the government have to pretend to be in control of everything when they're not in control of very much at all, you know. So, you know, if China has an economic uh, issue, Britain's economy is 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 in trouble, and yet, you know, you you have to have a chancellor coming on and sort of. Uh, Rishi Sunak has to do it now, and he does it quite. He's a, he's he's a sort of semi-natural performer, um, but he's not in control. Now that is both deadly serious and hilarious. <laughs> because the contrast before you know what I plan to do is this and what I will do is this and then they go away and keep their fingers crossed because they they, they don't know whether they can do it or not um and so there are kind of ways of exploring it but the the the, the live shows with me started I, I did um one of these cruises quite a few years ago you know where you give talks and I did one where the other two speakers were Esther Ranson talking about television and her glittering TV career and Martin Bell talking about his time as a war correspondent and I thought bloody hell no one's going to come to hear about what was going on at politics at the time and actually I found they loved it uh the 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 the, the talks about the dramas of the current time because uh, it's a myth that people aren't interested in politics, but you've got to draw them in. It goes back to this thing of communication. It is as fast as if you follow, say, if people are passionate about football, I can get them passionate about politics because it's the same, the, the same reasons for being interested. You don't quite know what's going to happen next to your team. You don't know what's going to happen next in politics. There are the ups and downs and personal dramas. There's much more to it than that, but 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 you can easily do live shows about current politics and in a way seismic events have helped the show really because there's always epic stuff going going on no it's a, yeah i went it's a uh, it's a great show and it's compelling and and it's kind of like you you have the drama built in every week there's something kind of built, new in, and comp- built in drama you think yeah you just say well what should, what should i choose to kind of reflect on and try and sort of make sense of there's always going to be humor in politics but the satire thing is very interesting. Peter Cook and others were brilliant in the early 60s in, in doing it, but it became so fashionable to portray them all as a bunch of stupid crooks. I think it, on one level it became quite dangerous, you know, that you thought, oh, blimey, you know, they're all kind of, all should be in jail or, you know, certainly locked up for one reason or another. Um and so I so I don't I don't do satire, but some who 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 does satire well now? I'm trying to think. Can you think of uh, good? I suppose have I got news for you at its peak? It could be hilarious. It's funny you talk about have I got news for you because we recently had John O'Farrell on the podcast. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, who obviously wrote uh, was a head writer on Have I Got News for You and on Spitting Image. And he came up with a premise which I hadn't thought of before, that he was worried, and, and from a psychological perspective, that that it kind of makes people switch off. Once they've laughed at something, they think the job is done. And, and therefore, they're not out on the streets. You know, we've done a meme about... Uh, 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 Boris Johnson or or Rhys Mogg and that's enough and it seems to then pass it quicker so it might actually have the opposite effect Yeah, that's very interesting and um, yeah, I think satire inevitably is not going to necessarily generate interest in politics because <laughs> so once you've had a laugh at these people and mocked them uh, you don't want to spend the rest of your life following these absurdities. Um, you know, so, um, uh, yeah, I don't think the likes of Have I Got News For You will be a trigger for a wider interest in politics. In fact, possibly the opposite. Um, but there's definitely a role for satire. But you see, that the, the, implic- the, the, the dynamic of satire is a false one, which is, and I've heard Ian Hislop and others talk about it, which is we need to uh, bring the mighty down to size by mocking them. 
Whereas I think the hilarity is actually the mighty are nowhere near as mighty as they feel obliged to appear to be. And that's which I, where, what I find uh, is, is right for humour and tragedy. <laughs> you know? um, and uh, I, I've, I've known politicians in despair about something or other. You know, I remember Alice Campbell saying when he used to go to these G8 summits, or they were once bigger, you know, and all the newspaper reports, the most powerful people in the world are gathered in this cocooned arena. And he said they were all terrified. Some were about to face the electorate and lose an election. They knew they were about to be out. Others, some economic nightmare that they could do nothing about. And yet the perception is you've got to cut them down to size. It's another reason why Johnson is like, because he because he makes people laugh, he, there's no grandeur about him. So that gives him space to screw things up and people still like him. Uh, because he, he doesn't go around grandly saying, well, yeah, I'll do this. Instead, he's sort of, where am I? So, oh, yeah. It's, you know. But that means when everything goes wrong, people are almost ready for it with him because yeah. he's never sort of grandly claimed things would go right. I mean, he does lie about the, the Brexit thing, but um, uh, he, he, it's given him more space, really, because he doesn't appear grand or strong. Yeah, well, it's wriggle room, isn't it? It's comedy wriggle, it's room. wriggle room. It's comedy wriggle room. Is that, yeah. I haven't thought about that before, but when people say, you know, what is it about this guy that he gets away with? And that's one, that's part of it. Okay, we've we've coined a phrase now between us. That's 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 one of our new books, anyway. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, very quickly, um, can humour? Because I was listening to what you said. And you were saying about satire not changing anything, and I think I agree with you. But can humour change perception in politics? Because I'm specifically thinking of, we had Rick Wilson on from the Lincoln Project. Um, and there was a perception, at least in America, that they somewhat did for Trump. Do, do you think it has some kind of effect? Does led by donkeys have an effect? Um, I I wonder even about the Trump example. I mean, Trump did alarmingly well in terms of votes cast in that yeah. last. I know he lost, but he got a hell of a lot of votes. And so I, I still think, even in the case of um, Trump, who was widely satirized and in in some cases hilariously so, I I don't think, to be honest, it did have much impact and. Mm. Um, you see, look at Spitting Image in the 80s with Thatcher and, I mean, she won landslides. They portrayed her as an absurd tyrant, you know. Um, everyone was terrified of her, and yet she still won. So I think, you know, it, it kind of, I think it gives people a lot of comfort to see, to laugh about these figures. And, um, but no, I, to be honest, I don't think it changes the course of very much. Yeah, sadly, that, I think that's you're that's right. I think what we talked about earlier, the you know, the way all communicators should use humour changes the course of things. Um, I don't think satire does, actually. You know, us no. saying, oh, look at this hilarious idiot. It, it, it doesn't seem to change election outcomes. Oh, dear, sadly. God, we've rushed through this. We've come to the part of the show that we like to call quick fire questions, Steve. Quick fire questions. Who is the funniest business person or politician that you've ever met? I, I think it's two. I've quoted two where I've laughed aloud uh, is um, Wilson and Blair. They've made me laugh out loud uh, being funny. Wow. I mean, there, there's two names I... I, I, I... I wouldn't have picked as being the funniest. Well, why particularly? Well, they, they've said things that have been... Uh, I've quoted a couple of the sort of Wilson lines, which are kind of genuinely good jokes, actually. Um, and every now and again, uh, Blair would have a line. It might well have been written for him. Uh, that kind of made me uh, laugh out loud. And he was very good at mocking... John Major and the divisions of that government when he was a young Labour leader. And he often used humour. Um, you see, Boris Johnson, who you probably thought would be the one I would say of the politicians, it's quite funny. He, 
he 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 is funny in demeanor. You kind of when he arrives, you want to start laughing. You know, but I remember Michael Parkinson saying when Tommy Cooper just walked onto a set, people were yeah. laughing. And it's the same with Johnson. Where am I? Where is all? And you sort of smile and stuff. But I, he's not witty. I, you know, you know what I mean. So it just yeah. shows sort of different ways of humour. So, so those two. What book makes you laugh? Um, yeah, I, I still laugh at um, P.G. Woodhouse. Um, I still laugh at some of uh, uh, Philip Roth's books. Um, I laughed quite a bit. I know this is taboo these days at um, uh, a memoir Woody Allen wrote. I, that, that Jewish humour makes me laugh. Um, I really just love it. And, uh, you know, so in fact, somebody said to me, God, that what Woody Allen wrote, he wrote a very controversial memoir, which didn't get published until subsequently because of all the furore around it. But he's funny, I'm afraid, you know, I'm gonna, yes. and, and so is Roth. And they make me, they make me laugh. It, 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 I, I love, love, love Jewish humour. What film makes you laugh, Steve? Tell you what made me laugh. Uh, it's just remind me. You'll have to remind me what it was called. It came out recently. Meryl Streep was president of the United States. DiCaprio was in it. It was a yes. wonderful. All the critics slagged it off, and I watched it, and I thought it was hilarious, and I laughed. But I can't remember its title because I've only just thought about it. I don't watch that many films, to be honest, which why I couldn't think of a funny one. But whatever it was, was um, very very funny. Don't look up. up. Don't look up. It was, it was, I couldn't believe it. It got two stars in all the film reviews. And I thought, oh God, this is going to be so clunky and terrible. It was, it was hilarious. And there was some laugh out loud moments in it. In your opinion, what is not funny? Yeah, well, I, I think most things are acceptable. So for example, Larry David takes, takes it as far as you can most of the time. Also, incidentally, with uh, stuff about being Jewish and so on, that um, would not, I mean, he is himself Jewish, so he can do it. Um, but he was sort of in the most recent series, was sort of making jokes about the pandemic and all kinds of things. So I think most stuff is fine until it comes to a point where you are going to offend millions of people. And by that, I mean, with some sort of justification. So I'm not one, you know, the, a crusader for um, pure free speech where you can say anything. But to be hugely controversial for a mo moment, you know, that row about Jimmy Carr telling a joke about gypsies. Now, it was appalling. Um, but I kind of wouldn't have stopped him from saying it if he wants to say it hasn't so I go quite wide in what is accepted in humor and some pretty outrageous things can still make me laugh and I don't get all censorious there we're you know it's really appalling that we're laughing at that I mean if it's if it's funny I think there's quite a range but obviously what? we were talking about the power of humor if it's being used to um, I don't know, you know, attack an ethnic minority or something, you've got to be bloody, bloody careful. But I, I, I go, I'm pretty accepting of humour. Well, and, and then we get into the political realm of that, is who's going to police that? Right, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're not allowed to find that funny, I'm afraid, you know. Um, and... And some of the daring stuff, you know, you, you, it is so outrageous that it is funny, I'm afraid, you know. Well, uh, and isn't it the job of uh, uh, comedians to, to push those boundaries? Because one of the things is that you don't know where the boundary is until you step over it. And, yeah. and, and uh, you know, in defence of uh, the Jimmy Carr joke, nobody actually said a word when it was in context in the whole routine. Yeah. And it was only when it was clipped on its own yeah. that the furore kicked off. Yeah, yeah. That's a very interesting example about news as well, because it had been on that Netflix for ages, hadn't it? And then yeah. if you see that bit was plucked out and it became a front page news story. And um, th there are quite a few examples of actually things that have been out for a long time that then, in inverted commas, shock weeks or months later. 
you've still got to watch it with humor because it is so powerful and it can affect the way people see you and others you know those 70s comedians you know who are you couldn't even play half the set of some of those people you know who were kind of racist and all the rest of it but um so it can it can get into some very dangerous places but as you say that even that raises the question who polices what is acceptable or not and um so yeah yeah i kind of fairly free about humor no i get it what word makes you laugh uh, what word makes me laugh happy because it's so absurd when anyone says to me i'm happy i become furious um because <laughs> it implies a sort of ignorance and insensitivity about the world and this is where i kind of become you know that jewish humor how can you be happy when there's all this misery around um and so um the word happy is a bit like some of the po political stuff we've been talking about is both hilarious and very dark because i say no no oh, hold on you can't be happy you've got to be miserable and that gets us into quite funny terrain and i i keep on bumming into people who tell me they're happy so it gives me a chance to engage with them to show how miserable i am and then they start <laughs> laughing which makes them even happier and <laughs> so, so i think the word happy is hilarious because it's just absurd oh no it's, it's a very interesting concept isn't it i mean i go because what does it mean is a, from a psychological yeah. perspective, yeah. I would go, well, 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 you know, I want to be more happy if somebody comes to me, I goes, I want to be more yeah. happy. It's, uh, you know, are you 100% happy about everything? You know, it is, um, but a lot, I'm taken about by a number of people who, who say it to me. And I, I always challenge, I said, you can't be, or else you're stupid. You know, you can't, <laughs> you know, because happiness is such a sort of, pure unqualified term i find it quite funny and it's fleeting as well you bet. yeah 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 just, uh, enjoy it. well I, well i'm very happy at the moment so that's great uh, what sound makes you laugh steve uh the sound of um drivers hooting in a traffic jam uh, which happens sometimes and it's so hilarious because it exposes all the follies of you know driving and cars because as if you, hooting makes everyone else start going at 70 miles an hour when no one can move and it's also very funny because they're often hooting in cars that cost about 50,000 pounds and stuck in the same traffic jam as someone in a little mini that cost 500 quid 10 years ago <laughs> um, <laughs> So I just think, you know, the sort of anger that that sound makes is hilarious because um, it, 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 you can't do anything. You're impotent when you're hooting. Oh, yeah, go on, you get going, you bus. And all um, so there's a silly sound. Yeah, God, well, yeah, you must laugh a lot when you're in New York. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not there enough. I should have more laughs. You know. <laughs> Come on, come on, come on! You know, no one moves, so it's completely irrational. And but it appears assertive, a bit like politicians. But actually, you've got no power at all to move the traffic by hooting. Come on, you bastard! You know, you know. And the more I hoot, the more likely they are to move. No, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's just silly. It's just silly. It, it is, but I love it. I love it. Great answer. Uh, would you rather be considered clever or funny? Funny, by miles, really? by miles. I just think it is the ultimate thing, uh, having a laugh. Um, and yeah, by, by miles. And it, to be honest, it's disappointing because I think because I used to write columns a lot, political columns, two, two or three a week, um, I think people, some people think, oh yeah, he's, he's a very sort of intellectual. You must read loads of books by Karl Marx, and, you know. Nietzsche and all these people and I just want to have a laugh you know so uh, so that I'm absolutely sure about that answer oh uh, fantastic and finally Steve and I know uh, you might be reticent to do this but uh, we're going to do it anyway desert island gags if you could only take one joke with you to a desert island what would it be well, I, I don't tell jokes, but I will. I've already mentioned Woody Allen. That the, I think it's the opening of um, 
Annie Hall, where he described his relationship as being like two people in a restaurant and one of them uh, complaining about the food and the other saying, yeah, and the portions are so small. That <laughs> makes me laugh every time I think about it. <laughs> um, and um, so that's one I think I'll take to the desert island and just laugh because, again, it sort of conjures up all kinds of themes. But um, that, I don't tell... I don't tell jokes, but I, there are some that I, gosh, the joy of laughter makes it worth enjoying a few jokes. Oh, you have to. Well, you you have, you have absolutely proved the potency of wit today. Steve Richards, thank you so much for being a guest on the Humorology Podcast. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. The Humorology Podcast was hosted by Paul Barros and produced by Simon Banks. Music by Steve Hayworth, creative direction by Les Hughes, and additional research by Helen Sykes. Please remember to subscribe, like, and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a Big Sky production.